Uh, a few words about our speaker tonight, uh, <coughs> although everybody knows who she is, a um, uh, very well-known personality. Uh, she's been involved in just about every facet of the media, TV and radio presenter and editor, journalist, columnist, panellist. She is an author, as you know, uh, founder of a magazine, founder of a charity, uh, also been a member of uh, Nyland Community Buyout Trust, the Island of Egg. Um, and she's also managed to fit in studying for a PhD <coughs> via Oslo and Strathclyde universities. Um, all of that, and she's still managing to attend speakers' nights. Um, we're very lucky to have her tonight, so let's give her a big warm welcome. Well, uh, just just to prove, whoops, uh, we didn't switch this on, did we? That will be the thing, where is it? Up there. Right. Yeah. Forgive me, everybody. Um, I was in the Pharaohs last week, and I kind of caught a wee gremlin-y thing. So I've got everything here. I've got fishermen's friends from the Pharaohs. They, they use them as well there. The, the, the bottle, which I may have to just glug and tea. Um, yeah, and I have to use my sentence of Norwegian now that you've mentioned it. Um, let me just get this up here. Right. Uh, yeah. Jeg er glad for å være her i kveld, men jeg snakker litt norsk, so the rest is in English. Which is basically saying, I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, and I learned Norwegian because of this PhD, which is comparing the hut and cabin traditions of Scotland and Norway. It would make you weep. Um, they, we're cousins. Across the North Sea, um, their land ownership patterns are such that uh, 579,000 wooden huts exist. That's not posh houses, that's huts. Purpose-built huts, often not with water, you know, that just for the weekend escape. So they have 579,000, we have 500. And it says a lot about a lot. So to do this PhD, I needed to learn Norwegian. I got a grant from the Norwegian government. I went over to Oslo, and uh, I was there for four months, got into their, um, their, their city archive, and was sitting with the blue gloves on, because it's a history PhD, looking at the 1920s. And I was looking at some old documents, so I was kind of beyond excited when the first lot came out, because this had taken me three years to get this far, and they were in Danish. <laughs> <laughs> Because Danish used to be the old state language of Norway. So my how I laughed. Um, <coughs> so anyway, attention to detail is sometimes not my strong point, but uh, when you calm down and look at it, they're not that different. And actually, that then becomes another point of interest for us. Because actually, if you look at Norwegian, Danish, Swedish, Icelandic, Faroese, they're, they're just variations on a theme. I mean, I know anyone who speaks a language would come up and clobber me, but you know, they, they are separate languages and respected as that. And yet they are as different, or as not different, as Scots is to English. And it's all these things that strike you when you start to kind of put yourself about the Nordic countries. Because, but the Caithness uh, connection was quite interesting because the Caithnesians all thought they were Nordic, hoped they were Nordic. Um, wanted to be a bit more exotic, and actually all the, the, the kind of place names suggest something different, like the, the case with Orkney and Shetland. So eventually uh, I kind of went over and started looking about and began to think, Do you know, we, we need to kind of open the eastern door again, because we used to have such strong links with the Nordic countries, and after the Union, when, when Scotland basically embraced the empire interests of Britain, we turned our back on Europe to a large degree and started shifting our interests and our, our exploitative behaviour, actually, into colonial interests in America, largely. Uh, but those links are really important, especially if you're trying to conceive of what a different country would be like in the form of Scotland. Um, I said I was uh, in the Faroes uh, just last week. Some of you may know a filmmaker called Phantom Power. He's done a lot of films, The Journey to Yes, and lots of other stuff besides. 
Anyway, the two of us decided we needed to make more films about our neighbours. You just need to know more about this. So I was chairing a conference there last week and Al came along. Uh, he'd, with so little money between us, he actually camped in the pharaohs. And you know, I'd say that to you now, you think, oh, that might be quite nice camping tonight, eh? Uh -huh. No, this was four degrees, right? He was hardy in the extreme. But I hope we've captured a lot of the feistiness that comes when you've got, when you're able to take advantage of smallness and even advantage of what you might think is a remote location. Anyone been to the Pharaohs? One. Right. It is like your last Monroe, actually, because a lot. Anyone else been to the other Nordic countries? Uh huh. Well, the Pharaohs are 18 lumps of barren rock, basically, between Shetland and Iceland. And um, they truly have the world's most powerfully devolved parliament. When you hear what they're able to do, you will know what to say the next time someone tries to suggest it's us. Uh, the reason that they have their powers is that in 1946, they had a, an independence referendum. Now this is amazing. <clears throat> At the moment, they have 50,000 people of a population. Back in 1946, it was probably 30, 30,000. I don't know, what's the population of Bears Den? If you sling more guy in? I know you don't want me to sling more guy in, but you know. <laughs> yeah, about there. So Bears Den and Mulgai decide they want to become independent from the rest of the world, right? It's that kind of proposition, except you're not sitting here in the leafy suburbs, you're sitting in a kind of, you know, very northerly, subarctic situation. Um, and the reason that they had even thought of it was that during the war, Denmark, the mothership, was occupied by Germany. They weren't, neither was Iceland, so, and neither was Greenland. So those three uh, territories, had the experience of running themselves. They had no support from Denmark, and suddenly a penny started dropping, actually. Why do we even want to be part of Denmark? It wasn't a sudden penny drop. All these countries had had thoughts about being independent, but the, 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 the moment arrived. So anyway, in Iceland, they were the first off the blocks, because they're big. Iceland is huge. It's got 250,000 people. It's enormous in the scale of what we're talking about here. So Iceland decided in 1944, we're off. Um, Denmark couldn't do anything about it. They unilaterally declared independence and nobody died. Uh, it happened and that was the end of it. Um, when the Faroese thought, right, we're next, they, they had a referendum and the result was 50.7% yes which was an incredible moment. Um, actually, it's interesting, as having been there, I was asking people, was that not a scary thing, to have such a slender majority for independence? Because you might remember there was a moment when that might have been our outcome. And they said, well, actually, what happened was, as soon as uh, no voters saw that the majority was just going the other way, most people just began to fall in with it and think, well, if that's what we're going to do, that's all right then. I mean, I could have gone either way, you know, I was a bit kind of, yeah, that's all right. So whilst on the islands people were beginning to get ready for this, the Danes quite cleverly gave them the world's most powerfully devolved parliament. Um, and actually that sort of knocked people out of their stride, and the move on to independence just didn't happen. What did they get? They got all the usual stuff, uh, which we now expect, health, education, control, and so on. Um, they were able to set up their own university for 30, 40,000 people. This is Bears Den and Mulgai University, right? Um, which, is, which is teaching in Faroese, which is a language more like Icelandic than Danish, and it's their language. There are 66,000 speakers in existence on this planet right now who speak Faroese. It's about the same as, as Gaelic. And yet they have a university and their entire island chain all speak Faroese. Uh, so that was pretty good. What else did they have? They have control over telecoms and broadcasting and broadband. And what does that mean? It means that they have the world's fastest mobile broadband. Eight, 18 lumps in the North Atlantic, fastest broadband. And it says, while you're sitting down, because I'm going to explain how this happened and it's shocking, basically the Faroese Parliament told Faroese Telecom to do it. Shocking, eh? That simple. Uh, I mean, in Britain, 
We're so used to convoluted, you know, opting out and tendering contracts and BT coming up with some cockamamie. I'm sorry, there's any BT guys come in here, but you know, everything. Uh, if it's energy, it's Scottish and Southern Energy trying to decide whether it's worth putting a subsea cable in to the best wind kind of coverage in the Western Isles, Shetland and Orkney. It's taken 20 years, they're not quite sure yet. That's what we're used to, these interminable delays that are built into the British way of doing things because it's all about the market. The characteristic difference of the Nordics and Britons and Britain is that in the Nordics they have worked hard to make sure that the market is part of society. In Britain, society is part of the market. And you see these characteristic differences everywhere. So to go back to the Pharaohs, which feels like going back to the 1960s here, you're back to really straightforward things where a government tells a public utility to just get on with it. So they have extraordinary broadband coverage. We were out in this film <coughs> um, on a lifeboat round the back of one of the islands, so you shouldn't get any coverage at all. They've still got 5G that's good enough for the skipper of the lifeboat to do FaceTime to his daughter in Copenhagen, who's having a baby in four weeks. <laughs> now, that's the kind of information you probably, you know, you want to keep in touch when it's like that. So it's incredibly useful for them to have that kind of thing. So they have 5G on all the islands, out to the 200 mile limit they unilaterally declared, and up to the height of the helicopters that service the fleet. Now that's powerful, isn't it? Uh, what else have they got? <laughs> They've got their own airline. Mogai and Bearsden Airline. <laughs> uh, in the 19, it's 30 years old uh, this year, so that's the 1980s I think. They were having a pretty rubbish service from the Danish carrier, which was also making a mint off of them. So <clears throat> they did manage to persuade another little company to believe in them. They set up and they had to pay massive compensation to the Danes for effectively stealing their route. But the result is they have five planes. So they have a regular flight to Edinburgh, one to Copenhagen, one to Reykjavik, and then they use the other ones to go wherever they feel like going on holiday. <laughs> so they all go on holiday together to Malta or wherever. You know, I mean, it's brilliant. Um, and the other, the, the other thing that strikes you is when you're in their extremely comfortable plane and everything, it takes less time to get from Edinburgh to the Faroes than it does to go from Edinburgh to Shetland, despite the fact the Faroes is further, because their planes are better. 95% landing rate in June, the month where there is usually a fog bank around Shetland, because their instruments are better, because they're using the broadband. This is the, the, the point at which you start banging your head off the nearest wall, because we could do that. We should be doing that. So there's another little achievement of them. Um, but possibly the, the, the biggest achievement they've got uh, is their right to sign international treaties. A little island, Bears and Mulgai can sign international treaties. This was a power given to them in 1946. And it wasn't terribly relevant until 1973 when the Danes decided to join the EU and the Faroese, 97% of their income is based on fish, looked at the common fisheries policy and just went, no. There's just no having it, other nations in here. This is all we've got is fish. You can ask a question about whales, but fish and whales. So, you know, we're not sharing that with anybody. So, uh, the fairway suddenly used, it's like a joker card for those of a certain age. The joker comes trotting on. We're going to play it. We're going to not sign up to join the EU. We're going to stay out, even though we're part of Denmark. So here's what happened then, 1973. Denmark joined the EU, the Faroes didn't. Now some of you are of an age that can remember the 1970s, um, although, as, as usual, if you can really remember it, you weren't there, but whatever. Um, and you may not remember anyone dying over this. In fact, you may never have heard of this. It caused so little trouble. So the Faroes were out. Greenland, well, Greenland didn't have as powerful a parliament as the Faroes because they didn't push for independence. There's a wee moral in there. Um, and when they finally got a more powerful parliament, what was the first thing that parliament did? It left the EU. So Greenland and, and the Faroes are out of the EU while Denmark's in. Nobody's deed. 
that's, that's a different model. Um, and to go even further, and again, it's quite staggering this, um, both those territories are allowed to draw down new powers when they feel they're ready to exercise them. There's no unseemly argument, there's no massive whatever, but here's the thing. If you draw down powers, you have to take over the budget to run them. And that's okay for the Faroese, because at the moment they have a Republican party that still wants to be independent, even from nice people like the Danes. Um, and so what they're doing, their philosophy, is that they need to be economically independent before they approach becoming politically independent. So they are, as a matter of policy, they are handing the subsidy, the grant, back to Copenhagen. Now it's all quite staggering, isn't it? You know, because here we're ratcheting every last penny out of London, whereas there they're trying to give it all back. Because their philosophy is that uh, they're beholden. If, if, if Copenhagen is holding the purse strings, they're beholden. And their economy doesn't thrive because it's not needing to run on all cylinders, and it needs to if they're going to become independent. So to say that they're quite a sort of amazing bunch of people is just putting it too mildly. Um, so that's one model of how a country could work. You know, if we, Scotland used to be geologically part of Scandinavia, England was part of something else. Um, everything shuggled around and we banged together in the middle and here we are. If we had remained hanging on to Denmark, we might not be here today. Because actually with that sort of outlook towards difference, we could be speaking Scots. We can have had our own parliament since 1946. We would probably be in a pretty groovy club actually, and we might not have actually got the head of steam up necessary to think about independence. But we're not. We're in top down, one size fits all, one singer, one song, Britain, that cannot conceive of managing to let people be diverse. And you can see all that at the moment. As soon as Bush comes to shove with Brexit, the control comes back. You know, it was just out, out on loan for a wee while until something important happened. That is an alien model uh, at our latitude. That doesn't happen everywhere else. This is the way that bairns are treated. And actually, even the tiniest little island chains are not treated like this elsewhere. So here's some possibilities for Scotland. Um, you've got that in-out sort of flexibility within Denmark. But generally speaking, if you're just looking at the Nordic countries, because they've been there, they've done it for 40 years, they've been able, as independent countries, to negotiate their own terms with or without the EU. Do you think we might learn something from that? I mean, any of you who've been will realise they also speak better English than us. There has never been a better time to ask. And actually, they're very supportive to Scotland. So, <clears throat> one, one set of attitudes might be what's called the halfway house. Some of you might have heard of this now. It's Norway and Iceland's solution. Um, both Norway and Iceland have got big fishing communities, and like the Faroes, they looked at Cod Fisheries policy and went, nah. So <coughs> neither of them joined. Um, the, the Icelanders began to think actually it would be useful to sell into the single market. So they were the ones who suggested a little bit of, kind of cuteness, which is called the European Economic Area. Now I know this is the point in the, in the thing where people who are beginning to think of falling asleep just think, I'll just have a wee nod. Dinny, right, Dinny. This is 30 seconds of, of this, and then it's all over and it's back to stories again. <laughs> so in the 1970s, there was not just one uh, EU club on the block, there was two. There was the, the kid that was to become the European Union, but there was also the kid that still is, the European Free Trade Association, EFTA. Now the EFTA guys didn't want any sort of big fancy stuff. They didn't want integration, they didn't want institutions, they didn't want a common currency. They just wanted to trade. And actually, that was so dull compared to the woohoo stuff that the EU was doing, that even Britain left in 1973 from these guys, jumped into the EU family. But these EFTA folk are still here. So uh, who's in EFTA now? There's only four countries and they're all tiddlers. They're Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein. The Alps and the Nordics, basically. 
Um, now, what they do, the, the EFTA four, three of them have decided they want to get into the single market without joining the EU properly. So they created, the three of them, with the 28, soon to be 27 of the EU, together, that is the EEA, that is the European Economic Area. You only get into it if you're a member of the EU or if you're a member of EFTA. Switzerland is weird, right? Switzerland decided it wasn't going to do this for the rest of them. It was going to have its own bilateral deal with the EU, which took them nine years to negotiate. Um, and they're having a lot of problems with it. So that's the options. Um, that could be an option for Scotland. Because we're the right size. We, I mean, the Norwegians and Icelanders have said that something the size of Scotland would, would, be, would be fine for them. It would bolster the North Atlantic states. It would mean we're not in the common fisheries policy, which possibly would please our fishermen. It would mean we're not in the common agricultural policy, which might mean that the gravy train stops for just long enough for us to decide who we think should get subsidies in this country for farming and for other things. Um, it would mean that we pay a heck of a lot to the EU. Norway, which isn't in, pays 98% of full membership just to not be in it. Um, and they have to follow all the regulations. In fact, Norway follows more regulations uh, passed by the EU than Sweden that's an EU member. So, you know, listening to the debate down south, that's never going to fly for a bunch of people that are as europhobic as, as England is. Uh, the other killer is that you have to observe the four key, one of which is freedom of movement. So what? You're going to go through all the kind of, you know, hassle and disruption and pain and lost jobs and lost futures of being able to roam free around Europe. You're going to go through all of that to end up paying the same amount of money practically and having to have freedom of movement. You know, if anyone can sell that in England, fair play to them. You know, let's bring them up here and try and get them to sell independence because, you know, that, that is not going to happen as far as I can see. There's too much of a, a political pushback south of the border about immigration altogether to tolerate it. So no matter how much uh, there's mutterings about joining the EEA from the House of Lords, politically, I just can't see that one flying. And even the Norwegians, uh, their foreign minister recently said they were dreading the prospect of Britain trying to join because it's too big. I mean, look at the rest of the membership. And having them in would basically mean they'd have to renegotiate all the treaties that they've negotiated over 40 years with this big cuckoo in the nest in the middle. And Britain's a different sort of society. It's not a social, vaguely a social democratic model, so it doesn't fit with a lot of them. Scotland, different question. Scotland would, would, be, would be a good fit for that one. So there's that sort of possibility for us. Um, and it's worth saying something else about that. Kind of who you rub shoulders with matters. Um, where you want to go matters. Because we're all in this room, and perhaps birth of it, pretty clear on where we want to get out of. But where are we trying to go? Um, now, this is a good question to be asking in Bears Den because of the dry ski slope. How many people here can ski? You're joking. Come on. Are you still alive? Right? How many people can <laughs> ski here? Is that all? I thought you'd all be up. Is that still open up there? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Right, that speaks volumes actually about, <laughs> about everything. Um, I couldn't ski despite living here in Bairnsdown, so the aforementioned ski slope for, I don't know, was it 10 years or something? Because it always struck me that um, skiing was not essentially very Scottish because it meant you needed equipment. And uh, the classic Scottish games are involved in only nothing except a jumper and a football, somebody else's football preferably. Um, so as soon as you start needing kit, it begins to be posh and you don't want to do it, and kind of like, that's it. So I didn't learn to ski, but when I married, I, my two stepdaughters did. So we went to France, up the top of the hill. I was talking to somebody else when they told you how to stop. Set off, realised I couldn't stop. So I'm hurtling down this slope, and right at the bottom of it, there's a wee lassie sitting playing. And I'm thinking, oh no, I'm going right towards her. So I tried giving it a few moves. I've got no moves because I can't ski. So before I hit her, <clears throat> I kind of cowed to the side 
bang my head, I get no sympathy from anybody. And Rosie comes up and says, were well, you not listening when the instructor told you how to stop? And I thought, this will be a big moment for her, you know, a responsible adult. <laughs> and I said, no, I wasn't, right. Um, and she said, well, what he said was, you just need to look where you want to go and your skis will follow. Where were you looking? <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if you've had a moment where a 12-year-old in your company suddenly seems to have the wisdom of Methuselah, but I was kind of looking at her thinking, my God, this is a huge thing she said. Because actually, what she's saying is very true. If you, if you want to avoid something, stop looking at it. Stop putting energy into it. You know, you have to do what feels counterintuitive. You have to turn your head and, and look at where you want to go. Or you will end up going straight towards what you're focused on. So I, that actually changed a lot for me. It crystallized a lot of stuff. A, I can't ski. B, Rosie's a genius. And three, where are we going? Because if you keep your mind on that and keep your mind on what's possible, it begins to orient you differently through the kinds of pretty narrow debates that we end up having here. So there's the sort of people we want to be with. Let me tell you one more thing about the Icelanders. Um, the group that I've set up, Nordic Horizons, that takes a lot of speakers over, they speak in the Scottish Parliament, we shunt them into the civil servants to kind of liven up thinking and so on. Um, and last year we did one with all different speakers talking about this theme about their relations with Europe, which is where McSmorgas board came from. And the Icelandic speaker, a guy, Jan Galpin, Hannibalson, came over. He's one of these. Anyone been to Iceland? I mean, they're fabulous barking people, aren't they? You know, they're, they're half Nor Nor Nordic on their male DNA and female on their, sorry, Scots and Irish on their female DNA. So the result is pretty barking, actually, in a good way. Um, so anyway, um, young Baldwin uh, just came, gave a great speech, went back. And when I was editing the book, I thought he'd written the Iceland chapter and I thought I need to just flesh out who these people are a bit because you wouldn't have who they are. So I started researching Jan Balfin and seriously my jaw was on the ground. Um, in 1991, you may remember or not, that um, Lithuania declared independence. It was the first Baltic Republic. And within days the tanks had rolled in and 14 people were dead at the TV station. So it looked as if that was going to falter, um, Lithuania would go back to being within the Soviet Union and that would be the end of it, um, or rather Russia by that point. And, and then a wee guy got on a plane in Reykjavik and flew to Lithuania, right to the middle of all the shooting, went into the parliament and on behalf of 250,000 people on a barren rock that's trying to kill people actively every waking moment of the day, he formally recognised Lithuania as an independent country. And the shooting stopped. And within days, there were other countries recognised Lithuania. And within six months, it was a member of the United Nations. Estonia and Latvia were next. And on each occasion, the first person in to recognise their independence was Jan Balvin Hannibalsen on behalf of Iceland. What an amazing thing to have done from such a tiny little country. And the result is, uh, outside the Lithuanian parliament, there is a plaque saying, with our thanks to Iceland, who came when others did not dare. And the Estonian parliament, the foreign ministry, sits in one Iceland square. Now, to say Iceland is punching above its weight is just too small a thing to say. They changed history. And when I realised, I've been mean, sitting beside this guy. He hasn't said a thing. You know, it's enough, that was the 1990s. Blinking. If I'd done that in 91, I'd be sitting with a t-shirt on every day of my life, you know. I liberated Lithuania. Or maybe I wouldn't, but you know. There would be a wee temptation. Um, so I said to him, why did you feel Iceland? Why, why did you feel this was your problem? You're not even neighbours. He said, well, we were talking about it, and we thought what was happening was the West was basically willing to placate Yeltsin and, and do, turn a blind eye to anything to stop the Russians re reverting to communism. So a few wee transgressions in the Baltics, 
yeah, everyone was prepared to overlook that. The same way as we've done with dictators in Africa. You know, it's better to have a dictator you know than a dictator you don't know. So that was what the West was thinking. And he said, we, we thought in Iceland, that's just morally wrong. Um, and it's also not in our interests. We are a small country, and it's in our interests to have more of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, it was an alternative set of outlooks, a social democratic outlook that was much more like ours. And that outlook, those rules, were too low for the Swedes. So it tells you a lot about the standards of their, their welfare state, because they reckoned if they joined, basically, they would be leveled down to the same low standards as the EU average that we're trying to rise up to. So the Swedes were a bit sniffy about it, but in the 1980s, after the wall went down, it changed geopolitics a lot. They had a bit of financial problems themselves, and they began to think, you know, having socialism in one country, yeah, it's fine, but, you know, we should be doing bigger things with neighbours. So they joined the EU, and you may not know that you do actually know who the Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden is currently. Um, it's a woman called Isabella Löfven, and when Donald Trump did that really annoying uh, first tweet of a picture of himself signing an executive order with all his men behind him, who he then sacked, uh, Isabella Löfven, the new Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden, tweeted a, a picture of herself with all her female minister colleagues behind her signing the executive order. But what was the executive order and what it was, it was redoubling Sweden's <coughs> commitment to the EU and to fighting climate change. They see these two as linked. Because what they're saying is, what Isabella Löfven says quite clearly, is you know, America is now absent you know, from, from, from thought leadership, it's gone. So who, what body is, is ready and is in the right place to take moral leadership in the world on enormous issues like climate change, migration, poverty? If the EU isn't it, then we're doomed actually, you know. So the Swedes are really redoubling their efforts to support the EU and try and get it into action. And they're also redoubling their commitment to combating climate change. Now this is staggering because the Swedes are probably the most, the most kind of green country on earth. Uh, they have the highest proportion of renewable energy in their mix. They have 62% of their energy comes from renewable sources. Britain has 4%. Even with the massive input from Scotland, that is nearly at 100% of electricity, not total energy, but electricity is green, even with that massive input from us, 4%. And actually, last year, uh, the United States, even with Trump, increased its investment in renewables by 1%. I mean, they are biggie. But compared to us, we decreased our investment in Britain by 50%. And the previous year, it was the same story. Now, I mean, it's Scotland's destiny to be the Saudi Arabia of renewables. That's what, what we've got. You know, it's on our doorsteps. We've got the mouse. We've got the oil and gas engineering. We've got the outlook. We've got to get on with this because we're the people who could crack tidal and we could crack marine energy. And if we do that, we do that for the world. And we can't do it when energy policy is dictated by a government um, who has generated so much uh, confidence in their nuclear policy that the city of London wasn't even interested in Hinkley C. So they're Sweden. Now, those kind of people, and then let's stick the Danes in because they joined the EU, they've had more referendums on anything than the Irish, I think they, the Irish are ahead of them, but, so they've, they've quibbled and they've had opt-outs, but they're in. So there's another option for Scotland when it's independent, is a pretty tasty back four. Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Scotland. I mean, I'd like to be there. That's, that's pretty impressive. And when you think about the kind of people you want to be knocking about with, all of these countries are on the, in the sort of frame of 
the sort of debates we're trying to have. They're not trying to have crazy debates um, about immigration that we can't have a different point of view on. They're not trying to have ludicrous uh, energy policies based on a blind belief in nuclear energy that we don't need. We've got to begin to move towards people who have not only got different relationships with Europe, but have got a kind of more open society, the kind of one we need. And just as a sort of parting shot, um, all these uh, countries, whether they're in the EU or not, they are all members of Schengen because it just makes life easier. So there's none of this huffy, you know, the way we're all stuck to the leper colony in foreign airports and by God it'll be worse soon because we're the ones who want to be better than everyone else and have to have more security and we're so special. Well, you know, even countries that aren't in the EU just join Schengen because it makes it simpler for everybody moving about because, you know, it's near biggie. And actually, a Nordic travel area was set up 40 years before Schengen because it made sense to them. So, you know, that's, we have been caught up for too long in a, in a rational sort of politics, in a Punch and Judy show gone mad because of England's preoccupation still with this sort of adversarial politics that comes from first past the post, which is a laugh, if it weren't so serious, that the so-called mother of parliaments is still deploying a system so patently unfair that I think only themselves and Malta are left using it. We've got to get out of this. And the great news is that when you lift your head and look at where you want to go, Scotland has two brilliant options for how it organises its trade relations and where it sits in the world. And I think that's not bad. Thank you. where you think your spheres of infer inference are, 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 are supposed to be. So um, it's, it's very difficult going to places and coming back to see quite how little um, our, our broadcasting is. And of course, as with all things, and land is the same, when you only have small amounts of something, you scrap over it. You know, if you had six channels, we wouldn't be having half the arguments we have because we would have all sorts of accommodation for sport being on one channel. Gallic on another, perhaps a whole Scots-speaking channel, I don't know. But because we're left with such little resource, we fight and scrap over every waking minute that you hear. Um, I do kind of, you know, despair a bit of the BBC were doing an interview just before you, most of you arrived uh, about, about uh, why, why there's a disconnect between independent supporters and most of the mainstream media. And I thought, I really don't know where to start when it's on that to me. Um, but but it's, it's, it's pretty epic now. And I think myself that the biggest problem arises from the fact that um, the media has not caught up effectively with what happened in 2014. And I think they think it was a campaign and it's over. And we should, we should all be back in our sitting with our slippers and, you know, watching street parties for Meghan's wedding. Um, it's not because of the way that, quite old fashioned thinking, that politics is about political parties. It's not about movements. And the referendum was a moment in time. It's not an ongoing part of an independence <coughs> feeling. So they think that independence isn't even on the agenda. And I'd have to say that because of the way they look at things, and because of the weight they put on political parties and leaders, if the leader of the SNP doesn't talk much about independence, they think it's gone. And no amount of marches or anything else is going to persuade them otherwise, because that's not how they're picking it up. So I don't know if that answers your question at all or raises other ones. I mean, you're allowed to argue if you want. <laughs> it's just in the standard of journalism that we have in this country, controlled principally by London, whether you like it or not, and you can correct me, um, I think is appalling. It's well, it is, it is controlled by, I mean, it is controlled by London in all sorts of different ways, but I mean, as many people will know from your own lives, uh, the most effective control doesn't require anybody to be on your shoulder. It's in here. So, um, I mean, when I, I worked in the BBC for 25 years, 
and I don't remember a single conversation in production meeting where anybody said, hey, how are we going to carve the nationalists out? It's just not that obvious. How it would work is that people would think the only reason to bring the SNP in is if you're talking about independence. In the same way as people think they only bring the Greens in if you're talking about air pollution. But the big difference, the SNP are the government. And at that point, we're the opposition and had a policy on everything. So, yeah, it's, it's actually internalised here. Nobody, you don't need many memos from London to keep you thinking um, the right way for them. Although I will say, in the 1990s, there was a memo that came up. I used to do, some of you may remember, uh, radio programmes, and used to do a lot of hustings in elections. And unbelievably, from I think it was 1992, someone will correct me, when did, when did we vote out all the Tory MPs? Was it 92 or 97? 97 it was, wasn't it? From 97, when there were no Tory MPs in Scotland, we were sent a memo from London saying that if we were doing a hustings, there had to be a Tory representative, and the Tory had to speak second. Now, Parties who had no representation at all, like the Greens, weren't allowed in. So I just didn't get that memo. Yeah. I, saw, I saw it later and thought, oh, well, that would have been interesting. But, you know, it was so obviously unfair. Um, but that was quite rare. But anyway, other points. That's the last here. Can I just say that, I mean, I am a member of the SNP, but my worry is that, you know, when you go in your chat doors, the minute people hear your SNP, sometimes the shutter comes down. I personally think we should be having bad badges that just say independence. And I wonder if the Scottish Independence Conference could take up the baton and march with it for independence as the leaders. <coughs> instead of it always coming back to bash Nicola or bash Alex Salmond, for people to see that there are others in Scotland who are not the nerds like us, but who realise that there are other people who want independence. Mm -hmm. My worry is, how do we get your message out to the people who, who are not going to have a chance to hear this? Yeah, well... In a little way, this series of films um, will be on YouTube, it'll be 15 minutes long, um, there's a longer version of half an hour, you're very welcome to get a copy, view it, have a discussion after it, Just, it's not thumping an independence message, which we had to really stop ourselves from, because it's aimed at trying to just get people to look at it and go, what? Um, so this is the small contribution we can make. Uh, but yes, you're, I think you're right, uh, there needs to be something that is just, a political party is an electoral machine. It's there to win elections, that's what it's there for. Um, big ideas, yeah, but actually most of the time big ideas come from first the political parties. So I've, that's why I've not joined your illustrious ranks, uh, because there needs to be an annoying little woodpecker outside it uh, who can say your land reform policy is no use, your centralisation of services is very bad, and if people don't feel that they are thought capable of running with their own communities, how will they ever be thought capable of running their country? I don't want a kind of Britain with a tart on top on it, don't think many people do, but we need to discuss that, and it's not very easy at your conferences because there are a parade of MPs and MSPs now, they're really boring. Your conferences used to be pretty jolly. I love them. Don't know. I mean, there is one way, and that is that that book becomes prescribed reading in all schools. <laughs> yeah, and that's not going to happen. Coming to your other point, though, I mean, really, I, I, have, I have kind of gone from being someone who was sort of within the middle of the BBC to being really quite persona non grata now. I earned, I earned practically nothing here last year and have earned more in Ireland last year than Scotland because all work has dried up. So you appreciate you're just on one side of the divide and that's the size of it. But coming to the Scottish Independence Convention that you were mentioning, um, that, I was a convener of, deputy convener of that, but uh, it's quite a slow sort of thing. It's quite, it's a bit bureaucratic, but that is sort of democracy for you sometimes. It has no resources. It could try and get some, but it's chosen not to yet. Um, 
I just I just haven't got the temperament for sitting in meetings, so I just pulled back from that and thought that my better contribution was to go out and start trying to make some films about the future effectively. So I hope that they are cooking away and coming up with a plan. Um, but it's a bit difficult because uh, we did have a meeting with Nicola Sturgeon and um, I don't, on the face of it, I think the SNP are not hostile to the idea of something else being in there. But to be honest, you know, if it came to another referendum, I think they would expect to run, run whatever's happening, because that's kind of what you like. <laughs> um, so it's, it's difficult. Uh, I mean, it's a shame. I hope that there would be something a lot more bouncy by now. There is, as you know, therefore, in the absence of leadership, what does happen is a plethora of people trying to get something jump-started. So, um, there is a Yes Registry event in Stirling this weekend. Um, there's also, uh, Dundee is, hold, is hosting a kind of training event for Yes groups. And I had thought it might be a thing that all the Yes groups, which are beginning to form into regional groupings, might think of creating a federation of Yes groups. Because that way, you've got some, some, some uh, de democratic grounding. I mean, lots of people want to talk about who would lead to something. This, to me, is supremely less important than getting a democratic grounding of something right. Because otherwise, where are you leading? Who? Who's got the right to say anything to you? Suppose you go off your trolley. What do you have? Do you have to get pushed under a bus? I mean, you know, we need democratic grounding with all of this stuff. And that's another wee problem in the Scottish Independence Convention. I mean, it's democratic to the tune that if you're an independence group, you can be in there. But why aren't you in there? You know, it's, it's some, not others, because basically if every yes group in Scotland joined, even this veritable hall would not be big enough, mm -hmm. happily, for the number of people that would be there. So until somebody does some thinking about how to get that structured, it sort of isn't firing on all cylinders. So I'm sorry to say that, but it seems true. I mean, do comment or whatever you want to say on this if you're... Do you agree with... Sorry, what's your name again? Janice. Janice, yeah. Do you think that there needs to be a, a separate, yes, sort of grouping or whatever to the SNP or not? Yes. I mean, you, you know, I'm not trying to force an answer, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I think one of the things, I, I, I enjoy the SNP because I thought that was Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, do a lot of people agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to come back to the last here at the back about the, <coughs> about the difficulties with the SNP and so on. Um, yeah, I mean I was, I was kind of asked to stand as an, as an MP and I really didn't want to do it um, because I kind of thought this might happen. The, 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 the SNP, its main objective is to get re-elected. 
And that's what a political party does. I'm not really objecting to it, but that is what they're for. Um, and then they need to be judged on the day job. Now, to me, the, the, the sort of logical way around this is just what you asked, which was, okay, so the SNP is there doing the day job, and you then have to have a movement that's 24-7 talking about independence. But that has to be staffed. Not a big swanky staff like yes, the yes campaign was. It just needs one or two folk, but it needs something. It can't be like, and there's no reason for it to be funded like a sort of ginger group. There's 47% of the population support independence, for goodness sake. People even in Bear's Den support independence, my <laughs> God. You know, so I mean, there's folk with two and hate me kind of to rub together that would contribute to something like this. And I'm, I have tried to push that while I was there, but it seemed not to be, it seemed not to be what other people wanted to do. So there's a stage where you hear yourself saying the same thing 5,000 times and just think, mm -hmm. So that's, that's problematic. Um, however, I guess the thing that also is true is that we have a template for, for moving towards another referendum. Now, a lot of people may be getting fed up with that and thinking, why don't we just elect a, an SNP government, say that, that that election constitutes independence, and do what the Icelanders and everybody really was, and just go off ski. Um, I mean, in a way, we are both boosted and trapped by the precedence of the first sh shot at it, in much the same way as those different energy types dictated what would happen with subsequent ones. Because since we did get that referendum and we got the right from the British government to hold it, now if it had been a yes vote, we might have found all sorts of shenanigans then because it was an advisory referendum. Of course, when it's Brexit, it's being treated like cast iron, but I'll bet you it would have been Guy Shugley if it had been our advisory referendum. But still, when I went to uh, Catalonia, um, astonishingly enough, BBC World, uh, decided to have a debate and saw an immediate parallel between the Scots and the Catalans and actually paid me to go out to Barcelona and support the Catalan minister there. On the other side we had the uh, Spanish foreign minister and a constitutional expert. Um, and it was an interesting debate. But what became clear in it was that the Catalans would give their eye teeth to have had the situation we had because they cannot get out easily of the box they're in because in, in informal referenda and unilateral declarations are not really going to get them very far. I mean, what became clear in that debate was that we, and it honestly chokes in your th throat to say this, David Cameron produced the gold standard of all ways of dealing with this because he, he gave, he recognised what was happening as a political issue and didn't try to tidy it away the way the Spanish are doing as a sort of constitutional breaking the law thing. It was a fair, it was a square go. Now admittedly, project fair, yada yada yada, but the fundamentals of it were there. I, I think myself, the Scots are a tediously law-abiding bunch, so we are. The Irish aren't. Um, the Nordics aren't, really. I mean, they, their great phrase is, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Yeah. I have that tattooed across the wall, because we need a huge and daily injection of that, you know, uh, that sort of attitude, but we're not like that. Some of that is quite good about us. I think part of the characteristics of Scots that has, has kind of held us together as a set of people, without even a parliament for hundreds of years, was a very firm belief in in democracy, actually, and in democratic ways of doing things. Uh, the late William McIlvenny was said once, was asked, what would be the national saying of Scotland? And he, he sort of said, it's not, well, do or mess with me, it's, that's no fair. <laughs> and he's probably right. So, you know, there's no point, I, I think, there's no point in us trying to conjure up the possibility of revolutionary statements, which I don't think would probably pull the bulk of folk with us. We also have this precedent of the referendum, and we need to get back to that because it is a gold standard. And that actually also suggests that you do need a political party 
to be very, very much at the forefront of that campaign because if it's going to be held in the sort of constitutional domain, then that actually is out with what a yes movement can easily do. But there's one, it's a bit like, you know, you can go training for a marathon, but I've entered the race. So you can become the yes movement as strong as you like, but Nicola Sturgeon is the one who, you know, fires the pistol. So I think this is all a bit difficult. We definitely could be doing with a more organised yes movement, no question about it. Um, but you can't get round that, that the way that we'll probably get there is via some sort of referendum, which really needs the SNP to bloom and liven it up a bit. And it's over to you guys, because I know from previous conferences how many, for example, on the land reform front, how many people, constituencies, had put motions in on that and weren't it called. Um, so I, I don't know what you're going to do at your June conference, but you've got an opportunity. Yes, <clears throat> I, I, I think there's room for optimism with the Yes movement. Um, I felt very much like yourself, I felt the things were not happening, the SNP is not taking a lead. Uh, but I went to a, a meeting in Grand Chapel uh, last week. Clyde Bank, sorry, yes, Clyde Bank, not Grand Chapel. And uh, I was surprisingly buoyed up by it. I came away feeling much. There was a lot of very politically active people, people who had been very active during the last <coughs> referendum, coming together, slowly building. There was, a, there was another one, uh, Rother Glen and Canvas Line, that doing the same thing. So things are happening. <coughs> yeah, but, but I mean, it, it, you know, yes, absolutely. I mean, luckily, because I go all over the place, I can tell you how much things are going, and they're, they're going like clappers. What for? Playing you are. Freaking, you know, I mean, all these places. But the, the thing is, is it, is it, it's not, you know, sometimes it's quite positive because real revolutions, I think, happen a little bit everywhere. Uh, the media doesn't cover them because the media likes a big thing somewhere. It doesn't notice that kind of change. But there's a stage where all this informality is brilliant and by gum, we've become past masters at it. Uh, but we haven't got a large, thing to sit and represent us in formal media terms um, and something to prove that we're actually this active all the time. And that does need some sort of level of organisation, which I think yes groups are reluctant to do. I mean, people will go so far but not really want to end up, <coughs> pardon me, I thought this would happen, um, have to sort of carry the world, which is probably what it feels like. Um, so there's somewhere, there's somebody else, yes, yourself. Well, uh, it's uh, it's difficult because at, at the moment, I th I suppose what you need to see you need to see the polls moving to have something to point at, and even then, Theresa's now got that now it's not the time thing off pat, you know. So, but let's deal with that first problem. Um, I, d I don't know about you, but I meet a lot of people now who come up and speak to me and they're no voters and they are really annoyed that they're going to have to vote yes next time. And that's the way they, 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 they put it. You know, they, they've not, in their heads they've not morphed into us. You know, they've not got saltar brains and they, you know, they're not sleeping in their saltar onesies and everything. But they look at the situation and they look at Brexit, see it as a disaster. And they look at the way the British government has handled it and has, has just been ashamed of every single aspect of what they see. And particularly sort of liberal types have just seen everything that ever mattered to them going down the swanee. Uh, they're not happy about being forced to this choice. And um, to them it's the devil in the deep blue sea. You know, they're not kind of swinging from a lamppost. And if they were asked right now, uh, are they supporters of Scottish independence? they'd probably still say no, because the moment of having to jump hasn't arrived. But they know when it does arrive, this time, they're really, really looking at it carefully. But they're not wanting attention, they're not wanting folk in their face, they're not wanting the media kind of coming and pushing them around or whatever. They're just quietly watching from the sidelines, trying to 
trying to gauge just how bad it is. I don't know, do you meet people like this? Because it's hard to know. I've met six or seven people who've come up, <coughs> have bothered to sort of come up and speak to me about this. And they've all had that same characterization. Now, maybe it doesn't need political leadership from Nicola, because these people are not stupid people and they're making their own minds up. But it's a bit difficult when there is the word independence is hardly raised. You know, the case for a different uh, future is not made. It's kind of difficult for other people to make it when, you know, the leader of the pack isn't mentioning a word. <coughs> and I did notice before I came out a piece in the Dundee Courier written by Alex Bell, who used to be an advisor, who was saying that actually what's just happened, you know, the big um, <coughs> debate over powers, it's actually the beginning of the end, he's suggesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because basically, Nicola has gone to the wall defending devolution. Not independence, but devolution. Um, now, I, it's an interesting article. I'm, I'm not sure I totally agree with it. Um, but it's certainly true that it's strange that this is where we're at that all the energy has been put into trying to protect the de devolution settlement. I mean, it, it certainly shames the other parties who eventually had to, to, to jump into line. But we still haven't seen the same level of energy put into the word independence since 2014. So, I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> uh, don't, sorry, Chair, sir. Sorry. You can come back in when the youngsters have had a shot. <coughs> I don't uh, agree entirely with what you say about Nicola defending devolution. I think she's defending Scottish Parliament, which is the manifestation of independence feeling in Scotland. Which is the manifestation of to, to discuss in to, to, to the manifestation that last bit. of the independence feeling in Scotland. Oh feeling, I thought you said failing, right. Which is Feeling, yes. Which is growing. No, I mean, which is stronger than it's ever been, Yes, I, I, th I think I'm, I'm probably with you. I'm only saying that that argument's being made not by me, but by, by Alex Bell. Um, but I, I think the problem's still there. That as soon as you start talking about independence, it's a bit like. I mean, I know what it's like. If you have been attached to independence, you, you know, you get your head shot off all the time. And it's difficult, but, but for whatever reason, when Nicola had said independence is back on the table, <clears throat> and then there was a snap election that nobody could have guessed was going to happen, and there was 500,000 votes lost, although you can have arguments about that as well, um, that does seem to have kind of caused a bit of a right, we don't mention that word again, until we're ready to absolutely go over the top with it. But the problem is, I think, people don't work like that. The brains don't switch on and off. You need to be pushing the argument a little bit all the time. I would, and if she can't do it, then that's where your argument comes in, that somebody else should be there who doesn't have an election to win, who could be pushing, you know, just be putting it forward a different uh, sort of perspective. Because the other thing that happens is, when there's any kind of debate on the telly, how, how many people are there? I've had <clears throat> once in my life the experience of sitting beside somebody else who wants independence, right? Because most of the time they do it like political parties. So you get Labour, Tories, and an independent supporter. Now, I think if you had a movement, you would actually end up with the possibility of an SNP and somebody else when we get nearer to the next referendum. You're allowed to disagree, aren't you? You need to do it at some volume, though. Sorry, but, okay. <laughs> what, what's going on in Scotland? And the manifestation of that is Scotland and Union is that the uh, UK is co coordinating everything to shut out the idea of Scotland speaking for, for Scots speaking for Scotland, people in Scotland speaking for Scotland, unless they're connected to UK interests. And I think that's that is what um, the SNP is facing at the moment. So it's very difficult for them to get any message out there. Oh, come and honestly, that's no. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, I, I, we, 
Al and I were right. No, just a minute. Al and I were sitting on this on the Faroes last week. Average to air temperature during the day four degrees. Al was in a tent because we had no money. Right. Now I mean, we're pushing ourselves out to try and do something. The SNP have got resources. There's a four hundred thousand pound war chest for the next independence referendum. If they're not going to use it, they should give it to somebody else. Bluntly. Now the trouble is that somebody else has to look like they're capable of using it. And that's the other difficulty in this situation. But the idea that these guys are all huckled up here and can I do a thing? Yes, they can. But the strategy at the moment is, I don't know what it is, if there is one, but it's definitely keeping your head down. Somebody's got to put their heads up. There's still somebody, the young chap there, aye. Sorry. One of the things that I try to look at when I have scared the next day is I always look at when we, when we get independence, I always try to see if we are starting from what the destination is. I mean, yeah. Even when, even in the strategy, when it looks at independence, there's a positive thing. They always look at it as a destination, in which case we have three options in my view. We can either join EFTA, which is an option which very, very few people have even stopped to know about. There's the European Union, which is what the SNP seemed to shift, which the SNP had proposed, which was one of the standing points in the last independence debate, and we tend to shy away from the EFTA agreement, or the joint European Board of the of Pieces. Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is that even imagine we are in the heat of the debate, the family members or even the media, and they do they say to you, well what would be your option as a start point when you go for independence? <coughs> and you say something like, Well, I think that the European Union is a good idea, but also the EFTA, and you say, Well that's a good idea and all falls apart because if you don't support the European Union, you're just as bad as the best tears. So how do you make a message across the people to say this is a start point? <coughs> This is our first break. We can, we can maybe start the European Union as a starting point and look for other ideas such as EFTA. But how do you get that message across the first of all the parts that keep the feeling that there's so many of the European political parties? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, it, a lot of this depends on timing. I mean, it does look kind of likely that we will end up, for a period, being out of the EU before we get another independence vote that looks more likely than less likely. If that's the case, then sort of re-entry, if you like, might actually be via EFTA and the halfway house. That might be a way to get back in. And that might seem quite logical. That's what some other countries have sought to do, not necessarily done. But it's not an irrational way to approach re-entering the EU. Um, and it does, remember, have the really important thing about the freedom of movement. I mean, you're really accepting, um, you're accepting most of the underpinnings of the European Union. Um, you are trying to avoid the common fisheries policy and you're trying to have a little bit more freedom around the edges. I'm not sure myself, I'm not really advocating um, EFTA, uh, but I'm advocating that we should have a blooming debate about it. Uh, and when having spoken to both sides of this argument, if you like, uh, there's, there's definitely advantages and disadvantages to both of them. In Norway, the, the uh, EEA is known as the Nike deal, just do it, because you're just on the receiving end of all these regulations, uh, and it annoys the heck out of the Norwegians. But a recent opinion poll only had 18% of Norwegians who wanted to go into full EU membership. So it's more like we, we don't know enough about this yet. The, the thing that struck, keeps striking me about, about the Nordic countries, and in fact all countries, is that they're very good at figuring out where their interests lie. And when they figure out where their interests lie, that's what they do. We have abstract arguments based on all sorts of nonsense, because Britain is a tremendously polemical country that has been, has been the victim of all sorts of dogmatic horror. Like Thatcher, that's just dogma. Where was the interest for people in any of that? And I think we've got to break out of this a little bit and try and think, what are Scotland's interests? You know, if, you, if you're in a room with a whole bunch of Nordic people, 
The Finns aren't trying to persuade the Icelanders to join the EU because they can see with the common fisheries policy it's a non-starter for them and vice versa because they know what their interests are. So we need to have a debate about what Scotland's interests would be. There's other, for example, you know, we have a lot more, obviously we have a lot more trade with the EU than possibly Iceland has. It sells a lot of it, and the pharaohs too, their biggest trade deals are with Russia, with fish. But that probably wouldn't be for us, because that market's already saturated. So, you know, we need to talk this through. But the cheery note is <coughs> that um, after this event, where we had that uh, redoubtable Icelander, Jón Balvin Hannibalson, and also an MP from the pharaohs, Björn Samuelsson, um, I took them round and they had a three-hour meeting with Nicola Sturgeon and Mike Russell, um, after which the Scottish Government put out a statement saying it was now actively considering EFTA as a possibility. I mean, what will happen is, of course it will get thrown in our face. Oh, you can't make your minds up, can you? You've got 62% people voting to join the EU. But, you know, it's more important to get to a different level of politics. <clears throat> So, yes, that's, that's, and you can look at it that way, and, and that, that's fine. 62% of people, however, were voting in the absence of knowing about anything else. I mean, if we really want to, if you're being consistent, the, the reason that people might query the whole Brexit thing is because there were so many unknown facts around that vote. People voted, in, voted blind, and there were outcomes which were not implicit in the vote which are now being taken for granted. Well, this is kind of true of our section of that vote too. It's not just England that voted blind. It's not just them that we're not sure if they want to be in the single market or not. I just think we need a debate about this. And it's sure, 62% of people might just do the same again, because it might feel better to just be in the safe club with the really big boys and the wee tiddlers, because we haven't got the cut courage. We haven't got Smedden. And that might be us. Um, Self-knowledge is important. You know, I'd, we'd all like to think we were Vikings, wouldn't we? <laughs> but if we're not, then that's okay too. But we, need, we just need to be able to have this discussion uh, because, I mean, a lot of the Nordic countries would, would be confident enough to take what, what might look like really kind of lateral decisions like that one Iceland took. Do you think the Scots would ever have got involved in Lithuania? In a month of Sundays, even if we were independent? I'm afraid we wouldn't, until we've had much more development as people. Um, I think it's in us, but it's not there right now. It's not our foremost set of characteristics. We're a canny, canny bunch. And, I mean, someone had pointed this out to me. <clears throat> I often always used to think that it was a great advantage to the Scots that we have separate institutions. So we have a separate education system, we have a separate legal system, and that institutional difference has given us a sort of conceit of ourselves, I think, through all the years there was no parliament. We had a sort of Scottish way of doing things that you couldn't exactly put your finger on, but it was there, you knew it was there, it was different. But actually, um, in a conversation with uh, a Norwegian, they think one of the great things that helped them in their independence movement um, was the fact that the middle classes hadn't been given perks. It, it, teachers have got a fair amount of control, arguably, from really walking on dodgy territory now, but you know, teachers have got a Scottish education system. Within that, there's a little bit of room for manoeuvre. Uh, lawyers have got a Scottish legal system. No matter how big a cheese you are in London, you still need to convert to Scots law if you want to practice here. That's quite a lot of control in a small pond. The point about the Norwegians was that, that their professionals had the same problem as their working class. They were all screwed, to put it bluntly, by the Danes. So actually, the middle class were right in their independence movement. They, they had the same, it couldn't get worse feeling that the working class had. But see, the professionals of Scotland, well, it could get worse. And we've become quite risk averse people. We're you know, all hoping our children will become teachers and everybody's opting to do English at university and nobody wants to be a plumber anymore. You know, 
there's an awful lot of inbuilt just nervousness in us. And I think myself that's what comes from not being given control to run our own communities. We, we don't have the experience of doing small lifting and, and we look at heavy lifting longingly and scarily <laughs> You're in equal measure. So, I mean, you mentioned the, the Isle of Egg buyout. That was transformational for me because I saw a set of people who wouldn't say boo to a goose slowly morph into the kind of captains of freedom that you see before you today who are cheerfully able to adopt all sorts of ideas and, and put them into practice. But it's taken 20 years of their lives to become those new people because they got the power to do it. So today on Egg, um, young people are being given plots of land free to build houses on. And you can build, if you get land free, you can build a two bedroom house for 400,000 pounds. Sorry, did I say 400,000? 40,000 pounds. <laughs> Yeah, 400,000 would be actually on the mainland. So 40,000 pounds for a two bedroom house. And um, I can remember there used to be long arguments about whether you could use native Scots uh, wood to build structurally on because it wasn't strong enough. If you have wood that grows further north, it takes so much longer to grow that it's dense and then it's stronger and it's why we use Nordic and Canadian wood structurally for so much stuff. Um, but these, these young builders on egg are just building beams at twice the width. And they're cutting the costs of house building phenomenally and the length of time. And the deal is this, that if those young folk ever sell those houses on the open market, at that point they pay back the cost of the land to the Isle of Egg Trust who do it again with somebody else. What is not to like? That's Nordic thinking. Because they're looking at the game and they're playing it with confidence. And they used to be like us. I can testify that they used to be scared of their own shadows. But, you know, a little bit of... of the, and, and, and the other thing is, in, a, in, a, in an island, it's even clearer to see what the downside is of, of, of being risk averse is, which is stagnation and losing your children. Because if they hadn't done something like this, their children would all have left. And they would be like all the islands around Scotland, which are losing population. So, you know, we need to rouse ourselves. Um, but I, that's why I'm a great supporter of all sorts of ways of getting communities to have an experience of running something. Because, you know, cometh, cometh the hour, cometh the community. When you get the feeling that you can run stuff, you know, the world's your oyster. But if you're sitting at the tail end of so many bureaucratic systems that you're even part of systems that say children can't have day trips outside in case there's cow plots and they get E. coli, um, you know, that nonsense is nonetheless a, a daily way of looking at life in Scotland. Massively risk averse. Just come back to the, I'm glad to live back here, but you said there the EU membership. See, from my personal solution, it would be like an SNP manifesto. It would be also that the SNP thinks the EU would be the option. There should be something like a single transferable vote with options at EU, EFTA, or EAT. That's my personal thing. And another point you were saying about basically like a kind of yes movement. Because I know when I'm going to the SNP branch games, and half the time just feels like a token chamber. <laughs> To be honest, you feel like you're just talking, you're talking yourself and nothing's really happening, in a sense. Um, I have set, set a cloud fund up by Yes Radio, which would run over the internet. It's just so different groups can actually start talking rather than just feeling like everyone's, their individual groups just talking to themselves. Nice one. <laughs> just come up to, do come up and have a wee talk at the end about the radio thing. Um, yes, the, 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 the idea of an STV vote, well, Good idea, but I have a feeling that um, you need to be you need to be using STV positively and confidently a lot before you're uh, before you're able to do this without getting the feeling that you're basically got too many too many cards up in the air. Um, I mean, we we have only had a pretty useless form of PR since 1999, 
Again, I'm sorry I am here to talk about the Nordic countries. They have had PR, proper PR, for a century. Now that is important because it actually means compromise. It doesn't mean one party being as big as the SNP actually. It means probably a splintering up so that you have, you have kind of parties you can deliver on the things they really believe in. So if you had a party that, I don't know, wanted more localism and wanted big land reform and wanted independence, there would be them. But and in Scotland, I think we're frightened of splintering because we sort of know somewhere in our archaic memory that if we don't bulk up, we're not big enough to be seen in London. You know, so there's an instinct to almost shut down diversity because it looks like it's an expensive luxury. And what you have to do is look like one utterly united front. Now, I've never myself subscribed to that because I'm a sort of troublemaker and because you end up lying. And I think myself that when people are inauthentic, it erodes them. And it erodes belief in politics, which is why I'm not in it formally because I know yet there's times that you have to be a bit diplomatic at least, which is another thing I can do very well. But the point would be, if we were using STV properly, I think, we would start to be developing smaller parties with which you felt a stronger uh, connection and that had very clear points of principle difference. You might even um, have, this is not us by the way, <laughs> this would be people who were used to this. Um, you would probably, if you were a Nordic country that had had a hundred years of this, you would have a party that wants independence now. You'd have these platform differences. You'd have a party that wants EFTA membership. This is how the debate would be being staked out, because we'd have political parties pulling out the tent pegs so that you actually had a debate within this. But because you've got one party that's sucking up practically all the independents vote here, because we're all too bloom and timorous to have a proper proportional system, um, you, you can't expect them to really air all the differences because it would probably blow them up. It, it sort of has to be, and that's my gr grumble with a one overarching p p party model because it doesn't allow you to have proper debates. Well, you can actually. Look, we're sitting here. Nobody's coming with a big gun yet, you know? Um, but it sort of seems to happen on the margins. You'll go to your conference in June, and you won't hear a snifter of this. You know, I mean, if you can stay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably being offensive, but if you can stay awake, you'll be doing well. <laughs> and that's, if that's what formal party politics has come to, it's a fair effect. You know, it needs to be better than that. But I don't, I'm not sure myself what will be, what will be the, the thing that will, that will cr create some difference. Because here we are trying to create one monolithic yes movement. You know, we're always trying to get everything to stand up into one group. So okay, I'm the one that said that would be a good idea. But because that's what we're like. We, we understand these one big groups that we can all sit in. But here are the drawbacks of it that when you have legitimate political questions, you can't quite find a champion for it because people are trying to hush up difference to look solid. Good point. Yeah, where were we? Well, I think you said there was somebody else here and the gentleman here at the front. Ah, oh, yes, it's yourself. And then Caroline <laughs> over here, and then I think we'll probably have to start pulling it to a close. <coughs> yeah. You mentioned one of the countries wanted financial independence before political independence. Um, how can you ensure that you're going to have financial independence? And how can you convince people that you're going to be able to afford what you're going to do? Uh, as the lady behind me very rightly said, the SNP is now a political party. It's no longer a cause for independence. Somewhere it would get lost along the way. We need directing. Who can direct us into saying, yes, we can do this, like the people in the island, giving the free land and people building their own houses. A different way of thinking, more progressive way. Um, who will guide us? Any suggestions? 
<laughs> On you go. Are you being a bit funny now or something? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I had hoped the Greens would, would bulk up and do a lot of this work. Um, but again, if they get a moment in, in the sun, or like 10 seconds of air time, their, their first choice will always be the environment and those issues. So whilst they're actually quite active in a lot of these things, and to me, you know, Andy Whiteman becoming an MSP has got to be one of the best things that's ever happened to the Scottish Parliament, because there was a man born to eat data uh, who needs an assistant. Um, they're not coming out first and foremost with these sorts of arguments. So I'm not sure. I'm genuinely not sure how this happens, but I do know, I think, that the way that change happens is for people to start considering it could be otherwise. Now, Scots usually scoff at that because I think we have a grabby sort of nature. Because we think opportunities will be gone if we don't take them immediately, we seize things fast. And anybody who sounds like they're taking a bit of time about it, nah. If I can't come up with something tonight that will show you how tomorrow we can have a different path, you're going to go, nah. I know you are. Because <laughs> I've got the virus too, you know, I understand it. But this is what comes from being in a culture which has historically left people feeling profoundly unentitled. So when it comes to practically everything, you think, even when you're living in an affluent area, you still have the behaviour of someone who thinks that this pint won't be there tomorrow. We tend to consume stuff when it's here because it might never be here again. Politically, that's dangerous. Okay. You know, that's dangerous politically because it actually takes time. You know, if you look at any of these Nordics, they would drive you crazy for how long they take to come to a decision because they're really consensual. So I think we actually have to start thinking through some of these issues. Do we want political parties leading everything? Have we suppressed diversity and difference too much within the independence side of things? How would we manage to, to achieve some difference in that? Will it take somebody just setting up another party? Or can the SNP be encouraged to do something different? I don't know, because I, I actually am fairly averse to being in parties myself, for the reason that this seems to be inevitably how they go. This is the question. I've been in the SNP for 50 years. They're not that much further forward. The cause has gone, the political parties here. That's all we've done, we swapped it. Well, your man at the back wants to argue. Have, have an argument. Well, I, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm sexy. And uh, I've God, always, you're wearing uh, well, aren't you? I've, I've always been uh, proud of being where I live. And I'll probably be proud of wherever I live. Wherever I live, I'm proud of being here. And I don't remember a time where more people are proud, proud of where they are in here. Actually, I'm, I'm proud 
of the Quran, and I think that's stronger now than it's ever been. I just wonder how much. I don't know because I was actually sitting in a library in Dundee trying to finish this blasted PhD and handed it at 10:30 on Sunday, two Sundays ago, the day after the march. So, um, but I mean, so I don't know. Were, you, were, were was the SNP urging you to join it, the march? No, 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 no. right. No, because it's See, all under that's the my point, really. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is, if there is no leadership, then there will be other groups come in, and there's, I've got to be honest, a huffiness in some areas, um, from some SNP groups or whatever, towards the yes type initiatives, whether it's been some of the yes shops. Now, it would just be nice if that didn't happen, and the clout of the SNP was just prepared sometimes to put their weight behind what, just as you say, was a people's initiative. Um, so. Nonetheless, if, if, uh, if other groups, more, if you like, mainstream groups, don't organise something that allows people to get some of this energy off their chest, actually you can't blame any organisation for moving into that void and trying to give people an outlet. And at the moment, people just don't feel that they've got an outlet because they're not hearing people talk about independence at all. Right, can we have two final questions? Chap at the front, and then followed by Caroline, and then we'll have to call it quits. Uh, a student point out about not hearing about independence. In the past, the SNP's policy was to immediately move for independence when they got a simple majority. At that time, it was 36 out of 71 or 72. I would think that most of the the old former leaders, even plodding old Robert McIntyre, would be amazed to see the SNP sitting on a, on a majority for over 10 years, and as it were, go round the outer run. The other thing is, you say, you spoke of the monolithic thing, you know, that being concentrated up right here. There was a time when the the movement here that some living memory was, was notoriously fragmented and quarrelsome. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Right, where's, where's the other question? Carly. Yeah, just, just a quick question. If, if asked, uh, would you spearhead the, the next independence campaign? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because... because well, there's a whole load of reasons actually, but I mean, one of them, I know I sound like I'm just being stickly and everything, it's far more important to get the organisation grounded, because everyone's one, to me this preoccupation with who a leader is, is very British, I'm sorry, because it's very, if we've got somebody who can articulate things and we can stick them up and, you know, they didn't make a total fool of themselves in the telly, then we can get behind them. And I think we've got to do it differently this time. You know, the great salvation for us will be when we start realising how many leaders there are everywhere and when we get a proper organisation together so that if you do choose to have somebody lead, be the leader, whatever that is, it's mostly just really a spokesperson, you've got a structure to hold them accountable, you've got funding to make things possible, you've got discussions that allow you to come up with policy ideas so they're not just spouting whatever things just come out of the top of their heads. Right, now all of that is what really would work well. And to have somebody who just you agree with most of the time, uh, who, you know, it's not, it's not the best way to be moving forward, I don't think, but it feels easier. Because that's the way we always do stuff. We get somebody who can talk, a, you know, I mean, good grief, I was sort of brought up in Ireland, you know. You get somebody who can string a sentence together and that feels like it's good enough. It's not good enough. I think our job is tougher, actually. I actually thought it from a different aspect, that you were more palatable than perhaps maybe, you know, an SNP leader standing up and you know, maybe be more, you know, better received by... Well, but, but uh, well, that's, that's, that's kind, and it's possible. 
I mean, as I said at the beginning, I do find a lot of people coming up and talking to me who are no voters, which is, I'm finding astonishing. Um, <clears throat> but there's something that they, they feel, okay, they could have a conversation here, which is fine. It's good that they feel that. Um, but it may be because I am seriously not, I, there's nobody behind me. There's nobody, there's nobody helping, but there's nobody dictating. And that perhaps is the strength to keep. So, um, you know, I think I think as soon as as soon as you have got a message, that's what people don't like, and that's politics at the moment seems to be very much about having messages and dinning at home. And I mean, you know, we're Scots; we don't like being given messages as if we were kind of automatons. People want a bit of crack; they want a bit of you know a bit of kind of conversation, and and not a feeling of kind of horror if they come out with some deadly thoughts about not being too sure how it would all work and so on. But as soon as you've got a cause, you become a different kind of person. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to, and as long as the media have got some people they've had on before, to be honest, it makes no difference. Because they're not all that mad, you know, there's a, there's a list, and as soon as there's another referendum, you just pick up the old list and go through the names. So, it won't make that much difference. It's the organisation I really would love to see people being big enough to think about. Thank you, Leslie. On that, we'll bring the question and answer to an end.